Are you there? Okay, good. Today, the subject that we are covering today is extremely secret. This time is really just for us. So make sure that nobody else is watching. Make sure you're alone. Make sure that... Sir, as your newly appointed media manager, I have communicated that this video is about automatic and non-cooperative target recognition on the following outlets. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Pinterest, Reddit, LinkedIn, MySpace, Google+, Blogbit, Roloio, Jambo, Noodly, Scoopgo. I have also acquired advertising space on the Hypersonic Flight Tatler and the Laser Guided Weapons Gazette, sir. What about horse and hound? They did not accept the advert, sir. Let's roll the intro. Hey, welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end because the stuff that we discuss here is not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. Automatic target recognition is quite a vast discipline and in this video we are going to cover radar ATR, but the same problem exists for each kind of sensor. In this video, I would like just to give you an idea of the kind of problem that do exist and the line of thinking that is used for their solution. In the first part of the video, we are going to discuss the basic concepts and in the second part of the video, we are going to cover the operational impact. Actual implementation of automatic target recognition algorithms is one of the best kept secret of all the military forces that actually make use of them, and the reason is apparent. Once you know the algorithm, you can find a way around. For this reason, there is no documentation in the public domain about the actual implementations. However, there is a corpus of literature about this subject that we can use to make educated guesses. The mathematics is a bit challenging, but as usual, we try to extract the ideas without getting lost in equations. So, radars emit electromagnetic radiation, and when a target is encountered, the radiation is reflected back to the emitter. The radiation is fully described as an electromagnetic wave, and it has a specific frequency associated with it. Let's assume, for sake of clarity, that is pure sinusoid wave. Just one single frequency. Actually, modern radars use waveform shaping to improve their performances, so their inputs actually contain many different frequencies, but this is subject for a different video. Usually, the reflected wave from the target doesn't have the same frequency as the emitted wave. If the emitter and the target are moving relative to each other, the frequency of the return to the emitter will change. If the target is moving away from the emitter, it will be lower. If the target is closing to the emitter, it will be higher. This is called the Doppler frequency shift. Uh, Otis, would you explain? The Doppler variation of the frequency is expressed by this equation where FD is the frequency variation, lambda is the wavelength of the radar signal, V is the radial component of the relative speed of source and target. Conventionally, if source and target are moving away, V is counted as positive, hence the Doppler shift is negative, and it subtracts to the original frequency. This is an effect commonly used by modern radar to filter out the ground clutter. It also has a lot of other applications, for example, in used in meteorology to detect turbulence. It is also well known to DCS players, but again, this is a different subject. However, there may be another source of Doppler effect other than the relative motion of the emitter and the target. If some parts of the target are moving, for example, rotating or vibrating, the energy reflected from those parts will have a Doppler shift different from the shift of the general motion. 
this movement introduces a frequency modulation of the rate of return that is called a microdoppler and it can be detected. The microdoppler effect is governed by a slightly different equation. Otis, please. The maximum frequency shift for a microdoppler effect is given by this equation where FD is the microdoppler frequency shift. Lambda is the wavelength of the radar signal. DV is the maximum displacement of the moving part. Omega V is the angular speed of the movement, rotation or vibration. The fact that the original wavelength is now at the denominator, it means that even for small movements, or as relatively low frequencies of the vibration, the Doppler shift is quite high and can be detected. If we plug some numbers in the equation for an X-band radar, which is the most common used by a combat plane, we see that a few millimeter displacement and in frequencies around 20-30 Hz produce a Doppler shift that is big enough to be detected. So, it is no surprise that any rotating part like compressor, turbines, helicopter rotors, propellers do produce a significant Doppler shift that can be used for the identification of the target. This is the core concept of automatic target recognition using microdoppler to recognize the target. And obviously it is easier said than done. For example, the aspect of a target might vary and the microdopplers vary with it. While the moving part frequencies generally don't change much, the displacements depend on the aspects we are seeing the target from. If the displacement is oriented in a way that there is no radial velocity, then there is no microdoppler. If the moving part is not exposed to radar radiation or the return is very low, which may well be the case, for example, for compressors, well, again, there is no Doppler modulation. Furthermore, the pilot or the radar operator may not figure out or identify the target just watching at an oscilloscope or a spectrum analyzer. The recognition must be somehow automated. The mathematics behind the identification is quite complex, but it can be summarized in few points from a conceptual point of view. First, the radar return signal is analyzed to produce a time-dependent spectrum that shows how the radar return frequency content evolves over time. Then the signal features in the time and frequency domain are extracted. What is done in very broad terms, in general terms, is to calculate some coefficients that may represent the features of the radar return. The set of these calculated coefficients is then compared with a database of coefficient sets and a ranking of the matching is produced. This is done by statistical algorithms or more recently by machine learning. Every set of coefficients contained in the database is associated with a specific target. The MiG-29 has a coefficient set in the database. The Sukhoi-27 has a coefficient set in the database. The MiG-29K has a coefficient set in the database. But also the F-16 has a coefficient set. The Tejas has a set. Any civilian airplane has a set of coefficients within the database. When the ranking is done, then the pilot or the radar operator are presented with a simplified view that is the most likely identification or a list of possible identifications. And there you have it. You have identified your target. 
If you think how complex is the chain of processing from receiving the return, creating the track, defining its features, analyzing the micro dopplers, ranking the extracting the coefficients, ranking the result, well, it's, it is almost surprising that it's actually working at all, but it is working. If you got to this point, bravo! And now, what you all were waiting for, let's discuss the operational impact. Without ATR, the view that radars can provide to the air battle commanders or the pilots is basic at best. They will see a collection of trucks moving on the screen and they won't know anything about them save position speed and altitude. To be completely honest, some deductions can be made about the track uh, actually observing their behavior. If a track has taken off from a hostile air base, you can safely assume it is a hostile plane. The size of the plane can also be inferred by the amount of energy reflected, so in general it's possible to discriminate small fighters and larger transports or tankers or other assets like that. And obviously from the flight profile you can guess the mission of the airplane. For example, cap fighters will stay at a relatively high altitude flying in circles or patrolling a specific area. In contrast, ground attack missions may fly straight toward a known ground target and probably they will fly to a lower altitude. Now, I suspect that some of you at this point will be screaming at the screen. What about the IFF? What about the electronic signature of the target? And man, if you are the commander, you surely know what the good guys are doing. So what is all this about? Well, the IFF and the other transponders are actually active devices and their emissions can be detected by the enemy. You don't want to use them very often. A fighter will probably turn on the IFF for a quick interrogation of a target already acquired just before firing. Besides, the IFF won't tell you if a track is hostile, will tell you if it has replied or not. A friendly plane may not reply if the IFF is accidentally off or it is broken, damaged. A neutral plane probably won't know how to reply to a, the IFF interrogation. Also, a friendly plane with a perfectly functioning IFF may not reply because simply they don't have the right codes for whatever reason, organizational or anything else. Similarly, if a plane is flying under a mission control, it doesn't have any electronic signature that can be used to identify it. Technologies like LPI radars or directional data links are important exactly because they allow to use the radar or to communicate in a relatively stealthy way without notifying the enemy what you're doing. In the modern air battle, the lack of an infrared search and track is quite a severe disadvantage because it is a, an entirely passive sensor that can replace the radar in many situations. In a modern complex air battle, the decision to use the radar is a delicate tactical decision and pilots may want to delay it as long as possible. This idea is behind some apparently strange solutions that do exist today. For example, the French Mika missiles comes in two versions, one with active radar homing guidance and the other with infrared guidance. The body of the missile is the same, so they both have some medium-long range uh, performances, which actually may seem wasted on the infrared version. In fact, the infrared version can be launched toward the target identified with the infrared search and track, 
it can be guided with a low probability of intercepted data link up to the point that the infrared sensor actually acquires the target and after that it is uh, self-guided. It is a medium range firing solution, almost entirely passive, so well suited to the modern battlefield. If the air battle is complex, it is generally very difficult to identify who is who. In a situation like the one that might have happened above Germany if the Cold War went hot, identifying all the targets, all the tracks flying from east to west would have been a monster problem. Telling red aircraft from re-entering blue aircraft would have been very, very difficult with hundreds or thousands of tracks in the air at any given time. Even during the Gulf War of 1990, the rules of engagement required a visual identification of the target, with the only exception of targets that had taken off from an enemy airbase and the contact was never broken. Over Serbia in 1999, some NATO aircraft were equipped with ATR. However, multiple layers of safety measures were in place and the target of opportunity identified with ATR could not be attacked if it wasn't confirmed to be hostile with other means. So, if the target doesn't give away its identity by emitting something, someone needs to verify in person what the target is. The optical device is like the one mounted on the F-14 or the Erst on modern fighters have exactly this function, avoiding to close within visual range with the target and still being able to have an image for visual identification. Yes, because if your plane has BVR capabilities, you definitely don't want to get too close. So, ATR is a technology aimed at resolving this problem. The other elements that you may have noticed is that the database of all the possible targets must exist for the ATR to work. And the only way to build such a database is by conducting electronic intelligence missions well before the beginning of the hostilities. This is one of the reasons why Russian, Chinese, American and NATO forces keep challenging each other. They all desperately need to acquire the precious electronic intelligence that will feed the database. There are obviously specialized platforms, but modern electronic warfare suites can actually record the emissions in a format that is suitable to be analyzed. In general, NATO countries do exchange this information among them, but there do exist asymmetries that are definitely not desirable. For example, a critical dependency of the F-35 is from large scenario files, which are actually created in just a couple of locations under American control. Without an up-to-date version of the file, while the plane may not provide to the pilot the kind of situational awareness that is probably considered the best asset of the F-35. If we connect all the dots, if we connect all the elements that we have described, we can easily see that ATR is a technology that is born to answer probably the oldest question that commanders and soldiers have asked since the dawn of human conflict. What the f*** is going on? That's all we have for this video. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Sir, you don't actually see them, sir. Yeah, okay. Bye. 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 Bye.